Hello, and welcome to the second episode of my Demon Souls Compare Through. We're continuing to take a look at how the world of Demon Souls was enhanced or changed for the remake, while also taking the opportunity to look at all the weird stuff you might have never seen before along the way. In the previous episode, we left off with the Dragon God punching us so hard that our soul left our body. But before we continue on, I wanted to follow up on a couple more things from the tutorial. I previously talked about this unique structure that's found behind the Dragon God in the original, which you can't normally see. Since we also can't see behind the dragon in the remake, I was wondering if they still bothered to put anything back there. Credit goes to RealMuffin64 on Twitter for showing this to me. It turns out you have a very, very small window of time where you can still enter photo mode right after the cutscene starts, and the Dragon God will disappear in that moment. It's pretty difficult to pull off, and it took me a lot of tries, but as it turns out, they didn't recreate that unseen set piece. But they did put a couple more giant statues back there. On one hand, I was hoping to see that weird geography get remade for no reason, but they really didn't have to put anything back there at all, and they still gave us something to find if we could figure out a way to see behind the Dragon God. That's pretty cool. And something I didn't talk about in the last episode are the strange mechanics behind actually dying in the tutorial. In both versions of the game, you're invincible until you reach the Vanguard Demon. Damage taken from other enemies, or even fall damage, will cap at 1 HP. Here's an example of hacking our Y coordinate to fall a massive distance that would be guaranteed to kill us anywhere else. But something you might have not seen before is what happens when you try to modify your health directly to zero. In the first area, it still triggers a death animation, but without even going through a loading screen, you'll immediately respawn with full health, remaining in human form. They really wanted to make sure that you wouldn't die sooner than they intended. Though, directly modifying your HP to zero in the second area does work, presumably because with the Vanguard now present, the script that tells the game to send you to the Nexus when your health is drained is now in place. However, it goes back to not working in the third tutorial area, this might seem strange because you're supposed to be able to die here as well, but it makes sense when you think about how your death is handled differently here. In the second area, you simply die by losing your health, and it's just that the Vanguard Demon is the only thing allowed to take it that well. By contrast, the Dragon God doesn't actually ever attack you. That might sound funny, but it's not for real, it's just a cutscene. And if we leave our stats up during the cutscene, we can see that we never lose health. So we can see that our first death that takes us to the Nexus is carefully managed to only be possible in two very specific ways, and it would be interesting to see if the remake behaved the same way when hacked. Okay, so now that we're finally dead, we'll continue on. But today we're not going to talk about the Nexus. We'll revisit this area later on when there's more stuff here, so for now, we're going to head straight to Bulletaria. Here's a few things we can observe in the opening cutscene. For this first shot, the camera doesn't pan as far right, doing a better job of centering on the main gate. For this angle here, the dragon is moved into the frame rather than using a point of view perspective. And the corpses in the dragon's mouth had some flexibility added and are no longer rigid. One extra detail in there that I thought was pretty cool is how the dragon now has some corpses clutched in its claws as well, but it has to let go in order to land, so we get to see one of those corpses get tossed. Something that's kind of neat about the effect of the stones getting kicked up is that it's randomized and has its own sort of physics to it. We can pause and loop this effect in the original to see it play differently each time. The same is true in the remake, which is not too surprising. It's not uncommon for games to give effects like this some variability to them. Despite occurring during a cutscene, the effect itself isn't a preset animation. 
and it's the exact same reason the crow in Dark Souls 1 never drops its feathers the same way twice. As we look around, we can see that the placement of objects is almost entirely the same. Occasionally there's a very minor change, like a single crate and barrel will swap positions, but basically everything is exactly where it should be. Though some minor variations were made to make things feel a little less cut and paste. In the original, we can see that these two crates sitting side by side are identical to each other. In the remake, it looks like they took the time to make a second crate that looks a little different, but they actually just took a clever shortcut. They made the crate more detailed so that the back side of it looks different from the front, and then they just flipped one of them around. So you'll find some simple but thoughtful repositioning of objects like this that help reduce visual repetition. We'll also find some instances of increasing the number of different objects in the area, so it's not all just smoke and mirrors. In the original, there's only two different kinds of carts down here. There's one with all the bags in it, and there's one that has a larger box in it. The remake replaces one of these with one that has firewood in it. But again, it's also not a new creation. In the original, we do find a firewood cart in the next level. So again, it's just another example of them being resourceful and trying to find ways to create some more visual diversity with existing assets. I find it kind of funny how exactly these carts were recreated too. They could have put any junk in them and no one would have cared, but the exact placement of everything in them is identical. One small alteration was made to the logo, or whatever you'd call it, that's found on the bags. I thought it looked oddly tribal tattoo-esque in the original, and it always felt vaguely out of place to me ever since I first noticed it. Now it's more readable as a crust of some kind, and I find it kind of funny that someone at Bluepoint was basically given this design and tasked with making it make more sense. Taking a look over the side of the bridge here, we can see that the perimeter still has that lower area to it. But they've turned it into a spot for planting trees. It basically turns that part of the bridge into a long planter running alongside it, which I find to be a thoughtful reinterpretation of its design. But of course, the elephant in the room here is the different looking architecture. Like we saw in the tutorial, there's a lot more steeples and pointy bits. This was an intentional design change to shift things from a Roman neoclassical look to something a bit more gothic and ornate. I'll talk a little bit more about Bluepoint's mindset behind this change when we return to Boletaria in a future episode. But for now I'll say that there are certain locations where I like the simpler designs of the original, like maybe the main gate doesn't quite need all of that going on. Not everything is always improved by simply making it a lot more detailed, but sometimes the embellishments are an upgrade. And I'm particularly fond of the set pieces that make it feel more like a livable environment, which we'll see more of later. Moving on, I like the addition of the Bulletarian insignia on the decorative shield straight ahead. In the original game, you wouldn't see this until you're inside the Tower Knights arena. I also like the added fire. It puts more of an emphasis on the presence of the dragons. And footprints of the dragon were added to the main walkway here. We can see that the wind direction is the same in both versions, pushing the fire and smoke to the right here. In the original, this effect is controlled by stats that not only govern the wind direction and speed, but also has different cycles with variable durations and intensity. It's that sort of oscillating intensity that makes its movement feel kind of natural and not too robotic. But here I've changed it so that it turns on and off in a very obvious loop. And here I've pushed the system to its limits to make it look really absurd. We can assume though that things like wind and smoke in the remake were rebuilt entirely from the ground up and don't use any of the system from the original. Speaking of new effects unique to the remake, I appreciate how walking around in puddles can make your feet muddy. You can also roll around in puddles to get yourself covered. This mud will slowly fade away over time. Seeing the puddle effects frozen in photo mode is kind of neat. We can see that it's a visual effect that's simply drawn on top of the water, and by purposely teasing out the boundary of it, we can get it to appear slightly beyond the water. So this all means that the actual body of water isn't being pushed around to produce splashing, which of course makes sense, as fluid simulation isn't a reasonable expectation here. I just find it interesting to think about how in a couple more console generations, these kinds of graphical effects might look as dated to us as the original game does today. 
Down here, we have the path to the execution grounds that's normally closed unless you're at pure white or pure black world tendency. But we'll include all the optional side areas as we first encounter them, instead of coming back later. Just a quick note about world tendency, it doesn't work exactly like how most players think it does. It doesn't use a negative 3 to positive 3 point system, and there's not really discrete shades of tendency at all. These aren't set in stone things, you can be between these. In reality, most pure world tendency events occur at positive 180 or negative 180 world tendency. But this discussion is a huge can of worms, and I'll save that for a future Demon Souls Dissected. The simplified explanation is good enough most of the time, but I did want to bring some attention to it for now. Since we're sequence breaking, we'll find our first black fandom mobs below. I like how these ones spawn directly in front of us, instead of simply happening to be in the environment already. Here we can also see our very first crystal lizard. It can be hard to see clearly in the remake because of the heavy bloom, but thankfully we're given control over that. With the bloom taken away, we can see the individual textures that make up the sparkling effect, and I think it looks really cool. In the original, the crystal lizards have this amazing animation where they bend over backwards and do a sort of weird dance to taunt you while disappearing. This animation still exists in the remake, but they've added some new variations, like spinning in a circle. I like that they took the time to add some randomization to how they disappear, and their weird celebration or mockery of the player helps cement them as the sassiest enemy of any Soulsborne game. The gallows, guillotines, and torture devices are unique to this area, which is something I appreciate about it. When you finally get here, it feels a bit like you're stepping into a forbidden zone. And here's your word for the day. These are all collectively known as different kinds of gibbets. A gibbet is any instrumentation of public execution, so a guillotine or gallows fall under that same umbrella. But more specifically, gibbeting can also refer to hanging a body on something like this for display. Everything in the remake is placed and constructed almost identically to the original, but one small difference is that the gallows in the original actually have the trapped doors on the platforms that would allow a hanging person to fall through. This was removed in the remake, and is one of the few instances of the remake having less detail for something like that. But before you get mad at simplified murder devices, I'm not entirely sure how these were supposed to work. The platforms aren't directly underneath where the body would hang, instead they're off to the side. So maybe they would pick up these platforms and move them into place every time they use them? I don't know, that's kind of weird. Maybe these were intended to be gallows where you could just push someone off. In which case, the platforms are already where they're meant to be. This would actually justify removing the trapdoors in the remake, since their placement in the environment suggests that they wouldn't use them. And some added detail does come in elsewhere. We can see some actual nooses still here. And over here, we can see just three different structures in the original, while in the remake, they're all different from each other. Again, this is all in service of trying to avoid copying and pasting assets in an obvious way. They also added a cage here, which is something that would have been likely to hang from one of these structures in real life. And now for what was the greatest jump scare I've ever experienced in a Souls game. <laughs> Okay, so those screaming corpses in Irithyll Dungeon were pretty bad too, but Meralda is way cooler. Here's a quick comparison of her White Tendency dialogue. I have you now, wretched traitor to the king. I, Meralda, shall show you no mercy. You wretched traitor to the king. I, Meralda, shall show you no mercy. I always appreciate little instances of dialogue like this, considering how the vast majority of invaders or hostile NPCs are silent in these games. Unfortunately though, I think Meralda and her Binded Cross set look much cooler in the original. A big part of it might be the skin showing, and that's something we'll see in a few places in the remake. With their vastly improved character creation tools, I wonder if there was some inclination to not always have your character completely covered from head to toe. But for Meralda, I think there's just something a little less creepy about being able to see any part of her. Being fully covered can cast some doubt on whether or not a normal human is still underneath all of that. And I like that the only thing we can barely see is one of her eyes. This distinction is augmented by some of the differences in the sound design. 
In the remake, she'll make normal grunting sounds and expressions of anguish, where in the original, she only ever laughs at you. <laughs> Another thing that humanizes her a bit more is the difference in her death dialogue. Are you dead already? You deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, she still laughs at you after dying, which isn't exactly normal, but in the original, this demonic voice crescendos into place, and it sounds really cool. Are you dead already? Oh. You deserve it. <laughs> Perhaps ironically, she was described as having a beautiful voice in the original, and this was retranslated to say sonorous in the remake. I would describe the original, demonic voice as the more sonorous one. I don't know if they felt that the demonic voice was a bit too on the nose or cliche, but you'll find other instances of dialogue in this game where they backed off on the effects. In the previous episode, I showed an example of some thoughtful panning that was added to the Monumental's voice in the opening cutscene, but aside from the extra panning, the voice itself sounds pretty dry. I shall guide you. I shall guide you to the fissure. Maybe they thought the dreamy effect was also a bit cheap and lacked in subtlety. But the end result is having some dialogue in the remake that sounds kind of dry and boring in comparison. This is unfortunate, but it's not a criticism directed at the voice actors themselves, who in some cases offer an improved delivery. Here's a few other differences in the binded set we can look at. The headpiece eschews the leathery cowl hanging below the mask, which we can assume is made of human skin. They also replace the belt around the neck with a noose. The human leather does get reincorporated more prominently into the body piece, however. All in all, I don't really see the impetus for redesigning any of this, especially since I think it was already seen as one of the coolest armor sets in Demon Souls, or even any of the Souls games. Okay, let's move on. I do love how this swirling mass of souls above the Executioner's Pit looks. This is another thing that could have been toned down, and I'm reminded of how the bonfire in Dark Souls became less magical looking in later iterations when they removed the orbiting particles. The same could have happened here, like we could have gotten a more vague aura of some kind, but they still made sure we could see individual orbs circling around, and they even added color to it that wasn't originally there. The same is also true for items. Those have orbiting spheres, and they didn't shy away from making the effect clear. Because of this, when you drop a bunch of items in the same place, you'll get a dense pack of these spheres. I've always liked how that looked, and it still looks great in the remake. Just a quick note about dropping items, you can only drop 30 at a time. When you drop the 31st, the first and oldest item you dropped will disappear. Behind the scenes, a list of dropped items gets generated, and it keeps count but it surprisingly doesn't stop at 30 and loop back around. I was expecting that to happen, but it does know how to keep counting higher and higher, and it can go into the triple digits at least. So being able to drop only 30 at a time is not a direct limitation of how the dropped items are numbered, but it's still likely there to limit how much stress you can put on the system. The remake works the exact same way. I imagine they didn't need to worry as much about an impact on performance, but there's also never a need to drop a ton of items at once, so it's not something that needed to be changed. While we're in here, let's also talk about ladder climbing. It is unbelievably slow in Demon Souls. It might actually be kind of realistic for heavier armor sets, but it's universal regardless of your weight, and it probably feels like there's something wrong if you're coming over from Dark Souls. Or, you know, video games in general. It takes 37 seconds to climb this ladder. What a thrill. With darkness and silence through the night. In the first reveal trailer for Dark Souls 1, there's a shot of ladder climbing included. To give this some context, bear in mind that the trailer opens up with slow, ethereal music and doesn't show any action or gameplay for a while. It builds and builds in intensity until it finally shows the player character in more exciting situations. And the shot of ladder climbing was included in that action packed sequence. Ladder climbing isn't inherently that exciting of a thing to show off, but I've always assumed that particular clip was chosen as something that would be seen as a welcome change to fans of Demon Souls. This context is probably lost to most viewers in hindsight, but I'd be willing to bet that's the reason that's here. 
Now, the slow climbing speed is the same in the remake, but they added a fast climb when holding the run button. Though this is something that has already been added to later Souls games, the difference here is that it doesn't drain stamina, so there's never a reason not to do it. Though unfortunately, this also means you can't do that hilarious instant ladder fall. And down here, we can find a bunch of corpses in the water. I like the implication for this environmental storytelling. We have the execution yard above, but it's surprisingly empty. Sure, there's like one pile of corpses, but for a world where you're pretty much constantly surrounded by signs of death, the one area you'd expect to be like the super murder zone doesn't have a lot going on. The remake could have showed a lot more gratuitous signs of gore here, but it didn't, which was the correct choice. My interpretation is that the execution grounds have been out of use for a while. When things fell into chaos and lawlessness, there wouldn't have been a need for traditional executions anymore. There would have been a struggle between those who fell in line with a lamp in service of the demons, and those who maintain their humanity. I think the pit being broken open from above implies they're taking a shortcut and just throwing traitors down there, skipping the need for the execution yard altogether. In the original game, the bodies in the water are comprised of one larger object file that has all of the bodies together. They're incredibly low resolution, but a close look at the faces reveals that they're all dreglings. In the remake, there's instead a combination of dreglings and soldiers down here. And what's fascinating to me is all of the added corpses. We have a pile down here where there wasn't originally, and there's also more hanging on the beams above where they only existed before if it was attached to an item. But if we take a look at the original map data in Dark Souls Map Studio, we can find more objects like that which were dummied out at some point in development. And upon closer inspection, they're placed and posed identically to what we find in the remake. So what we find down here is actually a restoration of some obscure cut content. And I think it's really cool that Bluepoint put it back into the game. We're seeing extra corpses in here, but it's still from software's design. The water was also changed to be a deep red because of all the blood. And I think that's a tasteful way of upping the gore, since it's kind of dark and won't be noticed by a lot of players unless they look closely for it. Something observed in Ryan Lecoq's Out of Bounds exploration of Demon Souls, which I'll link to below, is how the water down here aligns pretty closely with the river seen from outside. I'll show some more interesting Out of Bounds stuff later, but overall there's not too much to show here. You can tell that the design of this area was a lot more focused than the tutorial, so we don't find all sorts of weird remnants of experimentation. If you wanted to see what was on the other side of the main gate, or down the river, here's a quick look. But these areas simply dead end and run out of content like you'd expect. There's nothing strange to be found, at least not in these directions. And here's a few more environmental comparisons before we continue moving on. The river below was lowered a good amount in the remake. I assume they did this to make the area feel bigger, in a way. The main entrance behind us was given a lot more makeshift scaffolding. Again, I'm kind of on the fence with all of this detail being crammed in, but I do like what they did with the wooden gate itself. And here's another look at the broken fountain. They added actual water surrounding it, and also repositioned the angle at which it collapsed. As we continue through the level, we'll startle some crows. These are simply animated object files and not proper character models, and the only interaction available is scaring them off. In the original, it's only possible to do this by walking close enough. They didn't go to the length of making them killable in the remake, but they did at least allow projectiles to scare them away. So it's a very minor change, but I still dig it. It feels a lot better than this. They also added some birds flying above the entrance, and it reminds me of the 2D animated birds found elsewhere throughout the original Souls games. They might even still be two-dimensional here on the PlayStation 5, which is kind of funny to think about, but it's hard to tell. I wanted to see them closer up and remembered, well, I can just go up there, can I? But when you're up there, they're nowhere to be found. So the obvious expectation here is that only the ground level below is asked to load these birds. But I was surprised to see that they actually disappear from down here too, if you simply move the camera too close in photo mode. 
So the visual effect itself has some protection against proximity, and it's more complicated than simply being turned on or off based on where you're standing. Let's continue on. A couple druglings in the area have had the turpentine effect added to their swords. This does increase their damage a little bit, but Bluepoint has said that they increase the drop rate of fire items near the phalanx, and this was probably their way of justifying it. So there's a subtle trade-off in making the area slightly harder, while also making the player base better equipped for the boss overall. As we'll see in a moment here, some subtle changes were made to the environmental collision, which sometimes makes walking off ledges a little less awkward. Here we can see a spot where slow walking causes the character to get stuck in the original. In the original version of the game, we first find this particular insignia on this tapestry. Though in the remake, it was also added back into the tutorial, further cementing its status as a Boletarian outpost. I like how they kept the design of this other tapestry, and unsurprisingly, they all have cloth physics now, too. Now, I think our first sort of easter egg in the remake can be found in the books they put into the environment. In the original, they're all too low resolution to make anything out, and they appear to be illegible in the remake as well. But the difference is that they've added some that have interesting pictures. Here we can find a red book that's opened up, but laying face down. We can smash the table, and if we're lucky, we can get it to flip over. I think this book might actually be a reference to Latria, but you'll have to bear with me here, because if it was intended to convey something Latria-esque, they certainly went about it in a very ambiguous way. The page on the right here seems to have an empty frame, where the center of the frame shows something that was destroyed. It's reminiscent of the damaged paintings we find in the old monk's room, but none of the frames in the original, nor the remake, look exactly like this. So I don't know if this is perhaps concept art we haven't seen before, or if it's just something else entirely. This other page is in the style of an illuminated manuscript. I don't know if it's an original creation or not, but it seems likely to be from a library of actual book scans. If you're wondering what that could possibly have to do with Latria, I'll talk more about that in the Latria episode when we get there. On the other table, we also have another book that similarly comes across as self-referential. At first glance, it looks like Bulletaria. We can see what I think is the main entrance with some fire on the walkway below but it also doesn't appear to be sourced from an actual screenshot from neither the remake nor the original. So once again, I think it might be some unseen concept art, maybe. Actually, you can scratch that previous speculation. While editing this video, I found the actual source. When you go to select an arch stone, you'll get an animation of that area. And I don't know how they were made exactly, but they all appear to be some kind of artistic composite, and not just free cam video recordings from the actual level in game. You can see the full-size versions of these animations when viewing the corresponding videos in the gallery that gets unlocked after clearing the game. Here, we then just have to flip the image horizontally to make it match. I'm now certain that all of these books with images are self-referential to Demon Souls, and we'll see another example in a future episode. Now would be a good time to talk about idling animations. They've added a bunch of these to the remake. Enemies who are just standing around will often have some additional motion to them, which breathes some life into the environment. A lot of them appear to be unique, and some of them have a considerably long loop time. Here we have a couple soldiers carrying on. We'll also find a bunch of soldiers stretching, and even their stretching routines may vary from soldier to soldier. I found it interesting that the guy who pushes the boulder trap has a particular routine if you return to the area, but if the boulder hasn't been pushed yet, he has a different idling animation that I'm not sure anyone has seen up close until now. He leans against the boulder, and he kind of awkwardly looks off to the side every now and again. I'm not really sure what he's looking at. Either way, it's pretty wild that this one specific enemy got two different idling animations. At times, the new idling animations might add a very minuscule amount of extra difficulty, where shooting a distant enemy with arrows might prove a bit trickier if they're not standing as still as they used to. I'm not going to stop to point out every new idling animation, but I'll try to cover some of the ones I find interesting along the way. Back where we left off, we can encounter a small oversight with this particular one. If we carefully pull just one of these soldiers, we'll see this guy talk to his friend like as if he's still there. Now, if you wanted to be critical of these animations, I could see how someone watching the video might think they're a little goofy at times. 
But bear in mind that I'm going out of my way to show these up close, and in the course of normal gameplay, most enemies are going to aggro before you see a lot of this. So it's really just extra background detail, and any overacting is comparable to that of a stage play, where it looks fine from a distance. Also, most of the tougher enemies have pretty reserved idling animations, so the enemies still maintain stoic poses where it counts. Let's continue on. We'll make our way towards the mausoleum. As expected, the mausoleum is a lot more detailed, but I wanted to point out the stained glass we can see along the side. I do think there was probably the intention to do something like this in the original. From the inside we can see some glass, but on the outside we have this structure that looks suspiciously similar to the exterior of the Trojan Latria, which did have stained glass. So they probably just ran out of time, and adding windows like this to the remake was a reasonable reinterpretation. Though they did move them around to the side of the building here. On the front of the building in the remake, we get this neat circular window instead. Now, let's compare the interior. There's a couple extra objects in a few places, but they're all enough out of the way. I always like the sword and the stone thing going on with the demon brand here, and I wonder if it influenced the redesign of the accompanying statue. In the original, it feels weirdly Dark Souls-esque in a way. The figure has wild hair that's reminiscent of the Nameless King. In the remake, it's a lot simpler, and feels more reminiscent of standard medieval fantasy. This is one instance of making something more generic that I can get behind, since it comes out feeling more Arthurian to me. Here is one instance where I prefer the voice acting in the remake. It's subtle, but there's something a little less wooden about the delivery. Thou who seeketh the king's sword, I am the old king. Show me thine strength, and the strength of thine souls. Thou who seekest the king's sword, I am the old king. Show me thy strength and the power of thy souls. Once again, we find another armor set showing a lot more skin in the remake with Old King Doran. To be perfectly fair, the original did show quite a lot of arm, leg, and even some inner thigh, but now we can see much more of the torso as well. Again, it's kind of a strange choice, but it makes more sense to me here than with Meralda, considering how this armor is probably meant to be more ornate than practical in the first place. Okay, so let's make our way back down through the shortcut area. We can cut the chains that allow us to get the Jade Hair Ornament which belonged to the daughter of Stockpile Thomas. And here we see the first biggest change in the remake that was made to accommodate the lore. The corpses that drop from the chains are now female, indicating they're meant to be Thomas's wife and daughter. Why change this, and was this appropriate? I believe this was always the intention, but a combination of possible time constraints and potential self-censorship might be the reason the original game wasn't like this. A lot of people interpret the male corpses of the original game to be those of robbers. The idea is that they were caught stealing and made an example of, and that explains why one of them has the hair ornament. That idea kind of works on its own, but I feel like there's some context missing here. Apart from the idea that Boletaria seems pretty lawless now, and I don't think some petty thievery is a big concern, the first thing that stands out to me is how there isn't a lot of corpse variation in the original game. We only need to go a few steps away to find another corpse that looks exactly the same. And when you sort through the original models, you'll find that there wasn't much available there. 
So these to me feel kind of like placeholder models they already had available. Secondly, there's cut content of an NPC known as the Hanging Woman, who is begging to be put out of her misery. This likely belonged here. Are... are you human? Oh, the pain... the pain... and the ghastly odor. Please, put me out of my misery. Please have mercy on me. Oh, thank you. Forgive me, Father. Whether they felt this was too gruesome, or they just ran out of time, we don't know, but I like how the remake decided to work with that concept instead of completely ignoring it. I'd also like to point out how the remake allows you to see these hanging corpses from a distance, where they were invisible until you stood on closer ground in the original. It's no surprise that the PlayStation 3 had to be more conservative with rendering distant objects, but I just wanted to mention how I really don't think their particular absence is explained by that. I think it has more to do with just being an oversight, or something that was too low of a priority to matter. Uh, because if you go out of bounds to go high up above your starting position, you'll see how the dragons from later in the level are already rendered from the very beginning. And the area leading into 1-2 is already loaded as well. So when you have all this unnecessary stuff loaded, it's hard to imagine that a couple corpse objects really mattered that much. Now, even though the remake is probably capable of loading a lot more at once, I'd be willing to bet that they were careful to not bother with rendering all the same stuff from the very start. We'll see some evidence later that they changed which chunks of the level are loaded depending on where you stand. So I think they probably made an effort to be a little more efficient, and that's not all going to be the same as the original. Now, let's turn around and continue on towards Estrava. I talked about how Vaultine was prototyped in the previous episode, but there's one small addition worth mentioning here. There's actually two different ways to vault in the remake, which the tutorial isn't completely clear on. For any ledges where you can easily walk back and forth between the two different planes, you only have to hold walk in the direction of the ledge. There's no need to press the circle button. But for any ledges that cause you to fall or travel any distance where you can't immediately get back up to where you just were, they added the circle button requirement. This provides some extra safety that you don't do it by accident. And I forgot to mention it from the previous episode, but special thanks to Walso and Strawberry Simp for sending in scans from the original Demon Souls manual. Here's some Astrava. That was a bold jump. A surprise indeed. Well, now that you are here, pray thee, fend off these dreglings. That was a bold leap. A surprise indeed. Well, now that you are here, pray thee, fend off these dreglings. No matter how far I venture, only the soul staffed remain. Is there a single sane person left in Boletaria? No matter how far I venture, only the soul staffed remain. Is there a single sane person left in Boletaria? I don't really have much to say about the new voice acting here. I think there are some subtle improvements in the performance, but overall they're on pretty equal footing, and I don't have anything to nitpick with the new Estrava. Down in this area, we now have two different targets for target practice, and the straw dummy in the middle is now made up of distinct individual items that were cobbled together from the environment. Also, the weapon racks behind us just have a bunch of spears in the original, and we see an obvious repeat of two objects. In the remake, the weapon racks are positioned in the same way, but there's a wider variety of weapons here with no repetition in how they're laid out. If we go out of bounds below the ground over by these storage huts in the original, we'll find another one down there. The weird part is that this underground one is part of the map itself, while the other ones are just object files. And then if we compare the view when looking up from down here, we'll see some of the embellishments to Bulletaria that I'm actually very fond of. This to me doesn't have any of the downsides of where they sometimes overdo it with a more gothic look. They just added some architecture that feels more like a livable space, which is a nice thing to have. I also like how they added some windows you can see into to give some more dimension to the area. It gives a greater impression that there might actually be stuff back there. In the hallway by the Blue Knight, we're also going to see the remake do the opposite of what I think most people are expecting. They actually decluttered things and removed a bunch of objects. Along this wall, there used to be more bags. In this corner, a weapon rack was originally crammed in there, but they got rid of that too. Over here, we had a table and a couple chests, but now there's just one chest. 
There are a couple things added to the other side of the room, but overall there's less stuff in here now, which I found interesting. Let's go back to as if we didn't vault down earlier. I do have to admit to missing the original voice acting on The Dragling Merchant. It was really over the top. Be a brave knight or depraved slave. The demons will snatch your soul, then you'll go mad. And those who dare cling to their humanity are hunted down. It is the end of Great Boletaria as we know it. But hell, at least the demons don't send us to our deaths in battle. <laughs> brave knight or lowly fodder? The demons snatched their souls regardless of their station, plummeting them all into madness. And those who dare cling to their humanity were hunted down. It is the end of Great Boletaria as we know it. But hell, at least the demons don't send us to our deaths in battle. <laughs> Not that I could pick up on the Scottish regional differences myself, but I've heard the original described as a sort of scummy Glaswegian accent, while the remake has more of a generic Edinburgh sound, apparently. So yeah, the voice in the remake comes out a little more posh, uh, which maybe isn't the most appropriate choice. But I can at least appreciate how they got rid of this awkward pose that has this terrible clipping, which is something that's actually very common with Soulsborne NPCs. Another addition I like is the windows they've added along a lot of these walls here. At first I wasn't sure if there were actual rooms behind them, but it appears to just be a visual effect that creates the appearance of a 3D space. But it's well done, and it's neat that you can look into them. They're not all the same, either. The most common one you'll find is this empty room with a door on the other end. But in 1-1, I've also found this room with chains hanging on the back wall. It also has some shelving with some stuff on it. And on closer inspection, that stuff includes a few skulls. Then there's also this room, which has what appears to be a framed painting sitting on the floor in the corner. It also has a tipped over chair and some stuff in the other corner of the room that I can't quite make out. There's something kind of creepy about this room to me. We have this section here where these enemies jump down from above. The area they jump down from is inaccessible to the player, so I like comparing what we find out of bounds in the original to what we can see in photo mode from the remake. It once again shows how much effort went into enhancing the nearby areas that we can't get to. I like the new sound effects for when you knock certain enemies off of long drops. The extra housing here now partially obstructs what used to be a more open view towards the bridge where we meet the dragon. But that's okay because there wasn't much to see here before anyways. Though there is some detail out of bounds here in the original. This one particular rooftop has several objects and a staircase on top of it. But of course it's just a facade, as those stairs don't really lead anywhere. Over here, the original faked some depth to this inaccessible corridor. The outer columns are real, but there's a two-dimensional texture not far behind it. Here we can see how the remake opened things up, and put more actual space back there. On the path to the boulder trap, they lowered the height of this wall, so we can see back there a bit more. Not that there's a whole lot to see back here, but I like the addition of water running down the mountain wall. There's also some trees, the ground is muddy, and has rocks and leaves and a bunch of detail. By contrast, the original just looks like this, back there. Here we have the view of King Alance Tower in the distance.
Down below we can see 1-2, and in the remake we can now see some actual stuff rendered on top of the bridge, like the carts we find along it. And here's these rooftops below. It's another inaccessible area, but it's what would be above us before we step out onto the bridge. And of course, we have our first look at one of the dragons. They gave the blue dragon a more intimidating stance, and also hid the red dragon so we can't see its wings sticking out. I think they might have wanted to strengthen the element of surprise, so it's less obvious that there's going to be two of them here. Before we step down this hallway, I wanted to mention that the 2D fake hallway we saw earlier belongs to an unreachable area that would lead to the opposite side of this wall. In the remake they added a door here, making the surrounding architecture make a little more sense now. So this hallway is a good moment to talk about a stylistic choice that I know doesn't sit well with everyone. It certainly looks beautiful in the remake, but it raises some questions about the time frame of Boletario's corruption. While we don't have a clear timeline to work with, the Dark Souls games felt like they took place further into a post-apocalyptic timeline, where you kind of get the sense that things have been falling apart for years. Contrast this to Demon Souls, where it always felt a bit more like things just started going to shit recently. Boletario's not really in ruins by the time we get there, and a lot of the enemies are just normal looking people who aren't zombies. This to me looks like at least several years of abandonment. And again, it's not totally crystal clear, but the way NPCs talk about certain things, like Stockpile Thomas holding out some hope and learning that his daughter didn't survive after all, that just doesn't sound like a reaction he'd have if he'd been in the Nexus for years. That hairpin, that belongs to my daughter. Then she didn't make it after all. So in my head, it's always been maybe like half a year at most since the colorless fog swept in, and I kind of agree that they might have made things a little too overgrown. But all that being said, the more I think about it, the less of a problem I have with it. There's any number of excuses you could easily come up with. Maybe the grounds weren't well maintained before the demons arrived. Maybe time is kind of funky inside the Nexus. Or seeing how the old one is like some weird big tree thing anyways. Maybe these vines did grow unrealistically quickly. Who's to say the demonic corruption isn't like nature taking over, and that this didn't all spring up in just a few months? Plus, there are some conflicting vibes from the dialogue anyways. The Worshipper of God makes it sound like more time has passed. Back in the time that I lived below Boletaria Castle, King Aland left on some strange business, then returned with horrible demons in tow. I know some viewers are going to see this as making excuses for developers who they see as not understanding the lore, and who just made some poor choices for the art direction. And yeah, maybe. But the more I think about the implications of taking plant growth too literally in a fantasy setting where we have this, the less it bothers me. Plus, it does look really cool. Here's a closer look at the dragon's nest. Some of the charred corpses out here have changed in terms of what kind of character build they are, but they're all posed and positioned in the same way. One small change that I found kind of interesting is that in the original game, it's only the corpses with items on them that don't appear as charred as the rest. This isn't too surprising, as I believe it was once again just a limitation of not making a big enough variety of item-carrying corpse models in the first place. The remake mixes things up and makes some of the item corpses charred, and also makes a couple of the non-item corpses fresh. Also, in the remake, most of the non-charred corpses are now found nearest to the blue dragon. The blue dragon attacks with its tail instead of breathing fire on you, so the remake seems to put some consideration into who died to which dragon. Looking back behind us here, I never noticed this issue with the misaligned textures in the original until now. Alongside and below the Dragon Bridge, we have more of what looks like a functional town. If you look closely, you can see how muddy the streets are down there. 
I once again appreciate the effort that went into making this location feel like a livable area, compared to the original, but we can still nitpick and spot some nonsensical designs. For example, I don't know how this door was expected to open, there's really not enough room in front of it. Over here, we can see what I think was meant to convey a horse stable. I thought that was pretty neat because in the original we can find an unused object file for that. Its inclusion here might just be a coincidence, but I also wouldn't be surprised if they found some inspiration in digging through the original assets. And here we find evidence that the rooms behind these windows aren't really real. We can see that they're once again using that room with the portrait sitting on the floor in the corner. And if we move the camera over a bit, we can see two of them at the same time. And then we're going to see it again over here, and again over here. It's not too much of a surprise, since I think most of us have seen effects like this in video games before, but I give them credit for how convincing it is otherwise. I feel like this kind of effect is often, obviously, a visual effect, but here I found myself looking into these rooms for a bit, and I wasn't sure right away. And over here in the remake, I found something that I thought was pretty neat. Normally they're really really good about having more collision in out of bounds areas to make sure you're not able to move the camera anywhere weird during photo mode. But when I was trying to look at the bottom of the pit under the mechanism here, I found that they didn't make all of the walls solid. So we can have a little look at some stuff we're not supposed to see. Here's a look back towards the beginning of the level. And off to the side below the boss room, there's some kind of pulsating black sphere. We're going to see later on that object files get stored beneath the boss room here before they get pulled into the level, but I have no idea why it would appear as a pulsating sphere in the remake. Anyways, it's worth noting that none of the rest of the level below is rendered, or actually really any of the level at all, aside from the Dragon Bridge area behind us. This shows us that the remake is only loading chunks of the level at a time, just like the original version of the game. This is really no surprise, this is how almost all video games work. But if we do comparison between what's loaded from here to the original, we can see that it's not identical. This means they didn't just copy and paste how all of the draw groups work. That's not to say they didn't do that to start with, but this at least demonstrates that some effort went into changing how surrounding areas load, probably for optimization reasons. Something that's kind of funny to me is how the windows here are handled. We can see from looking out of bounds that the skybox is still rendered, so being able to see clouds out through these windows would have been no problem. But a closer look shows how gray and without detail they are. This is because they put a panel out here which blocks the view. I think perhaps the distant skybox wasn't bright enough, so they essentially tacked a light box out here to help brighten things up. So there's a trade-off between actually being able to see out of the windows versus having a brighter light that illuminates the upper half of this room. Things like this happen when you put the art direction before realism, which is perfectly fine of course. One surprising loss of detail is that in the original version of the game, we see the chains of this mechanism extend below, and they go through another layer of wooden boards. That wooden platform is missing from the remake, so if you crank the brightness in photo mode and look down there, you can see how the chains just cut off and don't actually connect to anything. Let's make our way to the phalanx. For starters, I like how they goopified the giant arrow. It's a nice touch. In the previous episode, I talked about my preference for the original fog gates because of how they're more transparent. Though that doesn't work out very well here, because of how the phalanx doesn't spawn in until you pass through the fog, so you'll just see it pop right into existence in front of you. It appears that the remake didn't change this, and instead just takes advantage of how its thicker fog prevents us from seeing that. For the music, I'm going to be a bit more negative here and side with those who tend to be more critical about the remake. There's nothing objectively bad about the new track, but it's like it tries its hardest to only be vaguely inspired by the original, rather than being a satisfying rendition. Now before I nitpick, I want to stress that this isn't the remake phoning things in. To rearrange a track so heavily to the point that it sounds this different is by no means lazy. This actually takes a lot more talent and effort than just doing a straightforward cover. But at the same time, so much of the original track's identity is lost, and I don't really understand the reason for this approach. I have to wonder if some of the people involved just didn't like the original soundtrack, 
or if they felt like doing a straightforward cover was beneath the talent they brought on board, I'm not sure. So what do I mean when I say the track's identity is lost? Well, there's a few prominent characteristics we can look at. The original has this descending, ostinato pattern of triplets that's front and center in the mix. It's really the main melody of the first verse. In the remake, it's replaced with a triplet rhythm that's a lot more monotone and doesn't descend down the same notes. So we're left with a reference to the original melody, like sure there's still some repeating triplets here, but it's no longer a melody. Now the proper descending pattern of notes does make a brief appearance later, but it's pretty buried in the mix and just isn't the prominent voice that it was in the original. There's also this part in the original where the timpani do this prominent eighth note pattern. This is also missing from the new version. And if you remember from the last episode, they also removed the driving timpani part from the Vanguard Demons theme. I think my problem isn't just that they didn't do 100% faithful covers, but I feel like if you were going to go back to the drawing board, you could at least make a checklist of elements that give the original soundtrack its vibe and lean into those observations in the rearrangement process. But it feels like those elements weren't ever recognized or incorporated. It's like the original tracks were only looked at through a very broad lens of music theory, putting too much emphasis on recognizing just the chord progressions and then running wild from there. When I think they should have been asking themselves more specific questions, like what instruments should be prominent so that it still feels like the original. Or, you know, is the melody still strong and even recognizable? I think the harshest way I could describe this approach to arrangement is coy. It comes across like they felt like it was better to merely suggest things that remind us of the original, when they could have just tried to strengthen what was already there. In the end, we're often left with what comes across as a profound hesitancy to embrace the original soundtrack, which is probably the worst choice you could make for something that is ostensibly celebrating Demon Souls. Okay, so if it all seems like I'm being overly nitpicky and dwelling on something that isn't really that bad at the end of the day, I'd like to stress that I really don't dislike the new track as it stands on its own, and I completely understand that it'll have its fans. The production quality is much higher now, and it's hard to fault it for anything if it was a new composition for a different game. But the reason I'm really stressing my dislike for it is to also kind of get this out of the way. Because what I talked about here is going to apply to a lot of the soundtrack. In short, I can summarize the differences with two main points. The first is that the new soundtrack was changed to have a much bigger sound overall. The original had some arrangements that were much more minimal and sometimes had very few instruments. But here they always seem to want a really big sound, and it becomes more generic as a result. The second is that the arrangements often feel like they're beating around the bush instead of celebrating the original soundtrack. Anyways, the boss itself is really cool looking, and its design translates over to the PS5 very nicely. Its whole glowing crown thing still looks really rad. I'm also a fan of another lore-inspired change here. When you defeat the boss, they added a very faint wisp of a human figure. It's incredibly subtle and easy to miss, and sometimes it's even hard to see when pausing things and taking a closer look in photo mode. They implemented this because the bosses of Bulletaria are believed to correspond to human figures we'd run into later, like they're sort of demonic projections of them. Longbow Ulan spawned the phalanx, hence the giant arrow it shoots out of its arena. Ulan is also said to have fearsome legions, explaining all the minor hoplites that accompany the phalanx. Then there's Alfred, Knight of the Tower, who unsurprisingly corresponds to the Tower Knight. And finally, there's Metas, the Knight of the Lance, who wields the Penetrator's sword. These connections were a cool thing to tap into for the death animations of these bosses. Before we move on, I wanted to revisit that spot where we saw the Black Sphere below the boss room earlier. Exploring out of bounds down here in the original reveals that it's a dumping ground for objects as they first get loaded into the area. In Ryan Lecoq's Out of Bounds Exploration, he jokingly referred to this as Long Dong Ulan, for obvious reasons. It's just a corpse model in a T-pose, and the Phalanx Lance of course, but this doesn't appear to be a dirty joke from the developers, since a bunch of different objects get stacked in the same location here, so it's just an unfortunate coincidence of when you have these particular objects at the ready. 
I have no idea what this box is, by the way. I have to go now. My planet needs me. Oh, and here's something else that's pretty cool. There's an unused cutscene of the Tower Knight in here. And we get to see a glowing blue color effect around its eyes, uh, something we don't see in the final game. Okay, let's move on to 1-2. While I'm also going to stop to take a close look at some stuff in this level, I'm largely going to breeze through it with some random side-by-side -side comparisons. The first level really shows off some of the bigger changes, while this level is a lot simpler and just being a long bridge, so I don't really need to go through the whole thing in order. One thing I'll point out about the starting area is that it's pretty close to identical to the original. Once again, almost all of the objects are placed the same, with a few minor variations here and there. Along the walls, we'll find more examples of something I talked about in the previous episode, where they added detail by putting storage nooks into the walls. This allows them to add more stuff into the environment without cluttering up the walkable space. And something I found neat about these is that none of them repeat. They all once again have a unique assortment of weapons. And a funny change here is that some of these wagons have had lanterns put inside them. Who bothered to light them and put them there? I don't think it makes a lot of sense, but it looks cool. And a couple things worth mentioning about the hoplites. Their shield is now available as a new weapon in the remake. It comes as a digital deluxe edition bonus, but thankfully it's still available as a rare random drop from them without that. And you can't ever normally see this in-game, but the hoplites in the original will have a second shield floating in front of them when they first load into the area. I think it has something to do with how they drop their shield when they die, but they might be switching over to that second shield seamlessly during their death animation. And to anyone who watches most of my videos, it'll be no surprise that I want to talk about this town here. I love when these games put a lot of effort into distant views like this, especially the ones that are purely visual and don't represent anywhere we can actually travel to. There's something a little mysterious about them to me, and I'm always itching for a closer look. There's an obvious parallel to the other Burg we see from Firelink in Dark Souls 1. It's a distant town below that doesn't really represent anywhere specific in the lore. Its primary purpose is to help increase the scope of the kingdom by letting the player see that there's more to the world than just the levels we traverse. The one small difference is that I believe this town is actually referenced by the Worshipper of God. Back in the time that I lived below Boletaria Castle. I mean, hypothetically, it could be some other town we can't see, but she describes it as the town below Boletaria, so there's really no reason this shouldn't be her hometown as far as our collective headcanon is concerned. The remake takes some liberties with its design, but the general idea is the same. We have some paths that are nearer to us, leading into the town, and then we have the town center a bit further back. Let's take a closer look at the one from the original. Running along the path that takes us into town, we can see that things are shrunken to help exaggerate distance. I like how this other forking path runs up a ridiculously steep cliff. We can enter the town here, but there's not too much to see at ground level, since the majority of the town is just a large, random assortment of buildings like this. So, going back above, we can see what the important landmarks are. There's a tower or monolith of some kind down here, and there's one closer to the opposite side of the town as well. And in the very center of the town, we have a church and fountain. I suppose this is where the worshipper of God did her worshipping. And then if we exit the far side of the town, we'll find another path. This path forks over by a couple buildings that are a bit further out, and it continues alongside a lake way back here. And again, here's what this all looks like from a distance. 
In the remake, the town is pushed off more to the right from this view, rather than to the left. And the distant lake now comes all the way to us, and there's even been a waterfall added nearby that flows into the lake. The added waterfall is pretty thoughtful in that in the original, the ground is sunken in, in such a way where it looks like a river might have been there in the past. So the remake didn't really have to change much to make the addition of water work. It just follows the train of the original game. It fits so well that it makes me wonder if this might have been the original intention. And we can find some ships out here now. Some are partially sunken, some have run aground, and others might be floating adrift. The town itself now has two sets of outer walls instead of just one outer ring. And if there's anything like a prominent church featured in it, it appears to now be higher up and looking over the town, tucked back over in this corner. We also have something else completely new here, which is a few buildings that overlook everything. There was also an outcrop here in the original game, so you can see how they looked at the original design and saw the opportunity to put a few things over there. The biggest difference is that they chopped off this segment of mountain here to have more room to push this town back below and to the right. And because of these changes, we can use photo mode to see the distant town from back by the dragon's nest in 1-1. Here we see some of the nearby buildings that were added to that outcrop, and we can see how it wasn't really intended to be seen from this vantage point too closely, since we can see that it's not textured properly from this angle. I would love to be able to see all of this up close, and I look forward to future hacking efforts. Now, let's take a closer look at the Red Dragon. The devs talked about making the wings wider, to help sell the idea that the wings could even support the weight of the dragon in the first place, and also helps make them appear a little more imposing. I'm not sure if it's just due to the wider wings, or some improved posing during its flight path, but here we can see how its wing no longer clips into the tower as it flies by. Making significant changes to an enemy model isn't something you can normally do if you want the gameplay to remain the same, but this was actually the right time and place to do this sort of thing. Being dragons that just fly in a loop, the combat involves nothing more than simply firing a bunch of projectiles at them. So having their models be shaped a little bit differently doesn't have a perceptible impact, especially since you probably weren't aiming for their wings in the first place. As far as other design changes go, they kept the design pretty faithful overall. It still has that pronounced beak that sticks out above its snout, and the face fins are still there and their proportions similarly. The bigger differences here are that the front row of horns are now significantly bigger than the ones in the back, and they have a sharper curve to them. The teeth are arranged much more erratically and give off more of a dinosaur vibe. The eyes are also a much brighter yellow now, which helps provide some contrast to make them more visible. And on the bottom of its neck, it has some horns, or whatever you'd call those, and some dangly bits. The feet did come out quite a bit different as well. Instead of having the fourth toe much further back, it's now alongside the other three toes, making it look a bit more like a human hand. And the legs look quite a bit thicker too. Despite the generally rock-solid visuals of the remake, I did find a bug here with how the fire appears on the bridge. When seen from a distance, there's a few spots where it just burns continuously despite no longer being there. That patch of fire we see? It's not really there and it would vanish from our view if we approached it. It's pretty far away so it's not a big deal, but if we turn around we can spot a more egregious version of this on top of the carriage ahead. And going into photo mode lets us get close enough to watch how it disappears as we approach. The one new effect that I thought was pretty neat is how the sconces along the bridge get lit by the dragon's fire, and they will stay lit until you reload the area. And here's another observation on the new idling animations. It doesn't seem to affect their line of sight. Here we can see how an enemy fails to notice me after turning around and looking right at me. Moving forward, it's no surprise that the next set of buildings are much more detailed. Some of the key additions are these statues and massive ornamentation. Like the path of the vanguard demon in the tutorial, we now have some statues tucked inside the walls here as well. And here's a look at the wall surrounding the fog gate. We now have a couple statues, the bulletarian crest, a couple tapestries, and more plant growth. The plants appear to be based on real-life moonflower vines. You've got the heart-shaped leaves and some white flowers that look incredibly similar. 
The room above with the crystal lizard houses a mechanism for opening the gate below, though the gate is always open and we can't actually interact with it. The remake makes a small improvement here by opening up the wall so that we can actually see back into the level, instead of having the chains clip through the wall. And one small environmental comparison here that no one cared to know about is how they took a spot where there was an unlit sconce in the original, and they added a burning torch back in for the remake. Up above there's more scaffolding and various objects added. I don't mind the extra stuff along the back wall, but I personally would have done away with some of the wooden beams directly above us. We can still see a lance tower, but unless if you go out of your way to get a clear vantage point, it's going to be partially obstructed. I would have liked for it to be framed a bit better. Basically, I just like the idea of the final boss's tower looking down on us. It's very Castlevania-esque, but the effect could be stronger here. And before we talk about the boss itself, let's go straight into some comparisons of the arena. Despite all the extra detail, the statues here are surprisingly kind of the same. We got the same arrangement of shield guy between two sword guys. In the original game, this would have been the first time we've seen this particular Boletarian insignia, but since we've already seen it a bunch in the remake, and we literally just saw one above the fog gate a moment ago, they came up with a new one for inside the arena. They now have a crest of the tower shield. It also appears that some thought was put into reconceptualizing the purpose of this space. If you stop to think about why there's a big random courtyard here that looks pretty important, it seems Bluepoint's answer to that question was to turn it into some kind of event space, most likely a battle arena. Where the original has these blank spots along the walls, these were opened up to have seating. You'll find rows of benches back there. And up above, they mostly blocked our view of some unreachable parts of the castle, and replaced it with skybox seating. But just because they blocked our view in some places didn't mean they got to avoid working on those vistas because they still included these windows that allow us to look in those directions. Some of the architecture that we see on one side is essentially a mirror image of what we see from the other side, but overall it's not a perfect match and they still put some work into customizing each view. And this is incredibly minor, but something I still appreciated. In the original, you have these gates that flank the entrance of the arena, but upon closer inspection they just immediately dead end shortly behind the metal bars, so they don't make any sense. In the remake, they actually change these to have a curved path that extends beyond our view. I dig it because sometimes it's the small things that no one asks for or cares about. Once again, I understand that some embellishments to the architecture go a bit far, but concept art for the original game shows a bigger statue featuring a rider on a horse, so I do think this area was intended to have some more detail. I feel like the exterior is a bit over embellished, but all of the additional seating was a really good idea. Okay, so onto the boss, finally. The Tower Knight remains very faithful to the original design, with some minor additions. A set of wings were added to its chest plate to make it match its shield, and the armor is more detailed, particularly with all the blue and gold embellishments. The armor in the original appears a little bit more worn down overall, like it's been exposed to something corrosive, uh, pretty much from head to toe. In the remake it still has some scratches and burns, but where they lessened the overall wear and tear, they made it look like this boss has seen some battle in a few other, more specific ways. Its shield has arrows stuck in it, the helmet has a big dent in it, and its biggest wound can be found on its back, which makes a lot of sense when you consider how its front side should be pretty well protected. We can also see some changes so that not everything looks like it's made out of the same metal. From the back of the shield, we can see that it now has a wooden core. I also like the grip that was added to the handle of the shield, and the Tower Knight's hands appear to be in a leather glove now. I also found it funny that we can find some stitching down here in the fabric underneath the armor. The boss fight itself has some pretty obvious parallels to the Iron Golem from Dark Souls 1. It's a large boss that looks to be made entirely of armor, there are other enemies attacking you with projectiles, and you attack its legs in order to knock it down. Something else that was probably meant to tie them together even closer is that concept art of Dark Souls 1 shows the Iron Golem missing a foot, so the original intention was probably to break it off in some way. Credit to Jester Patches for finding this and providing the scan. We can see Demon Souls iterate on the foot damage as well. In the original, when you do enough damage to the Tower Knight's heal, the armor will break off. 
though aside from the visual effect of blue stuff spewing out, it's only one piece of armor that we actually see suddenly get removed, and it just immediately disappears. In the remake, it breaks off in a couple stages, first revealing a leather strap under the armor, and then a bigger chunk breaks off, revealing a gash in the heel from which the blue stuff emanates. And these pieces don't disappear this time, instead they fall off and litter the environment. Though I suppose you win some and lose some with the extra details here. While editing this episode, I was surprised to see that the Tower Knight's attacks can break the statues in the original. I'm not sure if I never knew that, or if it was simply long forgotten, but try as I might, I couldn't get any of the statues to break in the remake. I wonder if this wound up on the chopping block intentionally, or if they might have just overlooked it, like I did. I'll be quicker about the music here. The iconic, but also kind of awkward choir chants from the original are replaced with something that's more palatable. I kind of get why they did that, but I do wish they could have had something closer to the original. We have the Penetrator, after all, where we already have a good excuse to do something drastically different for the remake. Other than that, this arrangement doesn't rub me as poorly as the Phalanx theme overall. We have that section with all of the long sustaining notes, and I think the remake did a fine job of conveying that melody. Even though the arrangement is a bit different, I at least feel like I know what notes are coming next, and something of the original manages to be captured a little bit better this time around. It's pretty triumphant, and I can kind of sing along for a moment. So that wraps up part 2 of the Demon Souls Compare Through. If I've planned this out correctly in my head, this should be an 8 part series when it's all done, and I hope you're looking forward to the rest. I promise the gap between this episode and the next won't be nearly as long as the wait for this episode was, but nonetheless thank you to everyone who waited patiently. If you'd like to support this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. I'd like to thank everyone who volunteered their time to help me out with unpaused photo mode, and an extra special thanks to all of my backers at the Evil Vagrant tier. Curtis Ware, Eric W., Gary Marshall, Harry Pham, Carl Germ, Lazy Tangent, Lude Frago, Moon Magic Witch, Nashua Nazari, Nate Hines, The Majalis Duo, and Zelther. Thank you all so much, and until next time, Umbasa.